Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to CARA. My name is Jenny uh, Katanal. I am the Public Programs Curator in the department. Um, CARA stands for the Center for Art, Research, and Alliances. Um, and we opened uh, officially in October um, with a uh, exhibition. But really, I'd love to think that we really began um, just a little bit before that last summer. Um, with a series of uh, programs called Conjurings that I I'd like to think to that time because the very first artwork that one encountered when they, when they arrived here was the beautiful poetry of, of the Millennium and the National Poet and Artist Diane Birds, which was installed right in the city corner. Mm -hmm. um, so our mission uh, to this who are here for the very first time is to um, expand. It's one of the expansions to expand historical records and public discourses um, to reflect arts abundance uh, and when it casts presence and features were very much about plur plurality this year. Um, and I encourage everybody to see the current exhibition. It's a group exhibition uh, and we learned so best created by our executive director and chief curator, Manuel Moscoso. Um, it's an exhibition about uh, what the touches on the body and technology are not uh, discrete, but actually are intertwined territories, um, and features the work of the local artist Susan Kite, who is working in Seoul and Southern Floor. I encourage everybody to come this Saturday if you're in town, because she will be performing <laughs> an modeling <laughs> performance uh, that uh, will be an interpretation of the of her of her dreams sports. Which are also um, engaging with CD writings, which she can um, geometries. So, uh, and also we have a program this coming Friday with the artist in the lead conversation with Dr. Sasimoto. Um, so, with that, um, I highlight the last letter of acronym, Alliances, um, which defines how what we're lucky enough to get to post the first summit for local context here today. And, I turn the mic over to Jane Anderson. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you so much, Cara. Thanks for the team for organizing um, uh, this first summit of local context. It's really exciting to have you all here and uh, to kind of share the work that we've been doing. I think we really are happy to kind of celebrate um, a lot of the work that we've been doing. But before we begin, like get Riley in the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we begin, I want to begin with an acknowledgement. Uh, we're here in the Napa lands of the Napa Nations. I want to pay my respects to the elders, uh, to the future generations, uh, to the Napa diaspora who are no longer on these lands and waters. Um, and they've been removed to uh, Oklahoma, uh, Wisconsin, and Papua. We kind of do a land acknowledgement because of what this work is about. Uh, this work is about addressing the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, settler colonialism has traditions and has habits, and many of those are embedded in structures. And so a lot of the work that we do in other contexts is to try and transform those structures, uh, creating different kinds of possibilities, kinds of futures that acknowledge that we are always on and and we need to always be respectful guests on those lands and waters. So I just want to also begin by um, talking a little bit about uh, kind of the genesis of the context to some extent. Uh, I'm here representing the uh, local context council. You guys want to have a seat? <laughs> um, and local context really began uh, 12 years ago. Uh, as an interview trying to think about the um, embedded, embedded bias within the intellectual property law itself and the way in which law functions, particularly intellectual property law, functions as a tool of dispossession and erasure. And so uh, thinking about the way in which law maintains the Bias and popular exclusions and erasures 
and how it wasn't serving Indigenous interests uh, in the kind of return of collections or return of control over knowledge and different kinds of resources. So we began uh, thinking about what other kinds of solutions could you develop that could bring Indigenous authority, acknowledgement, autonomy, sovereignty back into institutions that hold Indigenous collections. That's kind of the third place we started thinking about that. Um, of course, that kind of then grew to a much bigger project uh, that kind of crosses the humanities and the sciences, uh, moves into areas of data and data sovereignty, uh, and kind of takes seriously the responsibilities that both researchers have, as well as institutions that hold Indigenous collections, to disclose those collections, as well as making them available to Indigenous communities so that there can be Indigenous governance over those collections and data into the future. So we began as a research project to some extent, and then over 10 years has been iterating with the labels with communities around the world. Our team is uh, based in at least two countries at the moment. Uh, our team in Etaroa, it's very early for them. So uh, they'll join us online when they wake up. Um, <laughs> but we've also been able to transform and to think about sustainability of um, the context. So it's not just funded by soft grants from federal government, it's actually an organization that can sustain itself. So we're now a not for profit, we're to the Navajo Nation, and kind of starting towards a different kind of model of uh, sustainability for the organization and for the communities that utilize the labels and see the potential and possibility of transforming those structures through their own designs. I guess I um, want to say as well that the labels are a particular tool, a particular mechanism. Um, that bring Indigenous voices back into these spaces, but they're not the answer to these larger problems. They're a means to get somewhere else. And they're a kind of tool to kind of take people in different directions. So I think a lot of the projects that you'll hear about today touch in so many different other areas and kind of activate change. And that's really what the labels are. Kind of activate us for change and activate us for different kinds of relationships. And I think that's kind of what's exciting about what the potential of the labels are. So we're really just here today to kind of like celebrate all the work that has been going on, all the community work that has been happening to kind of make the labels do the kind of authority and sovereignty piece that is required of them, as well as hearing from researchers and also institutional representatives to kind of talk about what this decolonial future actually can be that we're moving towards. Um, I want to really thank my local context team, Corey, Felicia, Ashley, Vanessa, Jeanette, uh, Carlos, Paulina, Rebecca, everybody that's here that kind of makes it possible to kind of run an organization like this. We have um, I'll skip that bit. We have a community of users that is across the world. Um, obviously very heavy in uh, what's currently known as North America at the moment, but and Oceania, um, New Zealand, Australia, but also uh, in Europe, uh, Europe institutions that understand that they have a responsibility around the collections that they hold and the indigenous communities that are in, um, in Europe as well, as well as kind of moving into different spaces in Africa and the different kinds of needs that uh, the labels can respond to in those contexts as well. So we're kind of a global network, um, and that means that as our team grows, so does all the work. Uh, and I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you as well. So just two quick examples of kind of the potential and the scope of the labels. Um, this is a uh, song application on an iPhone uh, from the Bakatokia community in, uh, in Etoroa. Um, they are sharing their traditional chants uh, on their phone because they, a lot of their community are in different places. They're not just on their homelands in um, in, in New Zealand, but kind of utilizing the labels to kind of indicate how some of those songs should be shared and what are the expectations that that community has in sharing those songs. Uh, so I kind of wanted to bring that to you and we'll hear a little bit from Fakatogia some more in a free record um, really soon. And then this is also um, from Etero, this is kind of from plant specimens. Uh, that were collected that uh, Fakatoga didn't know had been kind of collected within a national collection. 
But now Kotoki have been able to add their commissions and their consents back into that record in a different kind of way. So kind of spanning from songs to data to plant specimens is kind of like really the stretch of what we're working with um, and kind of the capability and flexibility of the labels as a particular tool to kind of deal with those kinds of questions. Um, and of course, just thank you to some of our sponsors. We have we got here um, through small grants kind of built over this 13 year period. Um, and I'm really grateful to uh, you know all of our funders who kind of seen both the potential and the possibility of change that comes from developing something that gets comes sideways at a particular kind of problem. Um, so I'm going to now introduce Emily Johnson. Who is going to facilitate uh, our kind of day together? I'm really honoured to have Emily with us to, uh, to to facilitate. Emily is a land, water, and tree protector. She is uh, the founder of Catalyst Dance. She's also a co-founder of the First Nations Performing Arts. And so I'm going to introduce Emily to you. So thank you. <laughs> My, hi everyone. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Kyle, for helping us today and getting us started in a good way. So thanks to the entire local context team again. Jane and Cordy, Alicia, Ashley, Lena, and Rebecca, Carlos, and um, yeah, Thank you for bringing this extraordinary group of folks together today. <clears throat> um, I'm also a family, and I live between here, Lapay King, and Lomashonis, and I'm from the Yupik Nation. I'm a dance maker, I'm an activist, I'm a director of Catalyst, and co-lead of First Nations Performing Arts. And I'm often collaborating with the spirit of the local context. Let <laughs> um, me tell you a little bit about my work and why I'm here. Um, as I said, I'm a dance maker, but really to me, making dance is about reworlding and all of the work that you can hear today and that Jane has described on the processes toward and for that necessary reworlding. Uh, we have a dance we have this touring called Being the Future Being. I want to call that into the space a little bit because it's really about conjuring or making that better future that we all kind of dream of and work for, but making that better future realized in the present. Uh, I work with a decolonization writer, which is a means to change the structural harm embedded in cultural institutions. And thanks to Jane, the uh, context, it includes elements, it uh, includes sections toward protecting IP, like myself and collaborators and the communities that I work with. It, um, it also has section regarding disclosures that Jane mentioned. Uh, it goes into land use fees as well as coalition and anti-policing policies. Um, so take a look at that. It's a really good tool to use with your cultural institutions and it's also a great tool for artists and activists. And there's a template on the website you can put it to use right away. Um, with Ronnie Pinoy from First Nations Performing Arts, we lead a decolonization track, which is an intensive learning and learning series of sessions for presenters, executive directors, et cetera, leadership staff of um, said settler cultural institutions, um, settler run cultural institutions across the US. Um, Catalyst itself, uh, the kind of dance gathering company <laughs> that I run. Is um, our tenant is land back. And so our gatherings, all of our projects are, are toward that. For that means um, we host gatherings that encourage a reciprocal relationship with land, with each other, and with our market. Here in the Lapping Game, that means to use monthly fires that we host. And uh, the next one is tomorrow. You're all invited. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. at Abrams Art Center. And we also work to work with an activating structure called the branch of knowledge. 
And this sprint is dedicated to the back of the So one of the most amazing things that happened with our work with Branch College last year was that River Widow, who's our community organizer, worked alongside matriarchs from all of the Lenape uh, nations. So the Delaware tribe, the Delaware nation, and the South Virginia community, as well as the citizens in Canada. And River gathered matriarchs from all of these sovereign nations to get together and to talk about what they wanted to do. And they were very clear they wanted to come back to the homelands. <laughs> so we made that happen together. Um, we worked for um, we'll be going on eight months and to plan that trip, to organize that trip, to fundraise for that trip. And back in, I think it was the first <laughs> this group of 15 matriarchs um, from all of the Lenape nations came here to Lenape Oki for the first trip to back to the home. They brought the kids, they brought their grandkids, we had a feast together in the local community. They joined us on stage at the future meeting. We had talks and conversations, strategic meetings to ensure that return would continue. Uh, they visited places that they needed to visit. And we harvested corn and tobacco from the community garden. And this group has now continued to organize together and exist as Lenny the Hobbit Freyok, which you can follow on Instagram. They're making their second uh, return to the homelands next week. So it's amazing when we build these spaces for a uh, return. Um, this is land back and this allows for the, the building of the cap in our communities. Up on Haudenosaunee lands, we are in the midst of creating Build and Rebuild, which is a land based project focused on physical reclamation of land and space for Indigenous, Black, Latinx, and other artists and activists of color. Uh, it's going to be a place for rebuilding. And it will offer space for making, for rest, for recuperation, for skill sharing, and for sustenance. It's 42 acres. 36 acres will be protected forest. Six acres is currently being remunerated from its 35 years of serving as cow pasture to native forest and sustainable garden and medicine and food garden. And it's also a four story barn, which will be refurbished to hold all of the rebuilding activations for all of the artists, activists, and makers who will be welcomed to the space in the near future. And so maybe a that's local context and it can help uh, build a new world now. <laughs> um, and I want to say how lucky are we today to be together in this room. I'm a huge fan of all of the speakers and knowledge makers, generators of today, and I'm really in awe of all of the futures that you are all individually and collectively making in the present. Your work is so deeply A lot of listening today. So maybe for a second, if you'd like to take a deep breath together, you can close your eyes if you'd like. Take that deep breath in, in a way that you can Encourage that breath and enter every single one of your cells. Easily exhaling, preparing yourself for what you will experience and share to me. And that's really all we need to do, experience and share this work. There's a word in Luchtan which I'll share with you, which is Yichokni, which means pay attention. So I like to think of listening in this way. Pay attention to all of yourselves and all of your senses. Pay attention to everything that's around you, both uh, physically, the known, unknown, but also what is around you in terms of lineages, of knowledge, and of ancestors, and in the futures of sovereignty. I turn this over to Corey and Felicia and Molly. And um, just introduce yourselves in the way that's good for you. And I'll be back at 11.50 to help guide some questions and please close the text. Yeah. Hopefully, um, if I'm speaking for five minutes, I'm going to explain about me and I'll try and speak up a bit. Um, but I just wanted to introduce myself really quickly. Um, Corey thought I had the slide, but I'll just keep talking about <laughs> um, I'm 
Felicia Garcia, Samoa Shimash. My homelands are in Southern California. I'm really blessed to uh, be able to call my own homelands home these days. Um, in the top right corner is our sacred mountain, Alotoponush, and that's actually what it looks like right now. It's covered in beautiful wildflowers and poppies. Um, so I just like to ground myself by giving um, my gratitude to my own community, my ancestors, my family. Um, on the bottom right is my mom, my grandma. That's at my and my new graduation here in Lenape Hokin. Um, I attended the master's program at NYU, which is how I became connected with Jane, Corey, the rest of his team, and um, started to become involved in this incredible work. Um, and I also like to pay tribute to um, the Tewa people, Olokogi uh, Awinge is pictured on the bottom left. And up until the last uh, few months, I lived in uh, Tewa territory, San Diego, New Mexico, and I just really like to um, show my gratitude for the time I spent as a guest in those lands. Um, I work for Local Context as the Community Outreach Manager, and I'm really excited to be here with you today and to share a bit about um, the work that I've been really privileged to do with this incredible team. Um, so hi everyone here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and also hello to everybody who is watching the live stream or the recording. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and space to be with us today. Uh, my name is Corey Rowe. Uh, I use she her pronouns and I'm a settler. Uh, I normally live in what is today known as Connecticut, uh, here in Providence Atlantis. I'm very lucky and grateful to be here on what we hope you do today. Um, this map shows the indigenous lands that I've lived on throughout my life. Um, like Felicia, I went to NYU Museum Studies. Um, for that, I went to University of Vermont for undergraduate, uh, and I'm originally from Connecticut as well. Uh, and these are some pictures of where I live and my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we really wanted to kick off the summit with highlighting some of the incredible ongoing work that's been going on um, by folks who couldn't be here today, because we're going to hear from a lot of folks who are doing really incredible work today. Um, but not everyone can be with us today, as Jane mentioned. Um, our, our friends in Asparoa are just hopes of sitting right now um, and just thinking about sharing this incredible work that's been going on. Um, so we, we are also going to show this map um, of our outreach network, our outreach efforts. Um, each pin represents uh, folks at various stages of their journeys with local context. Um, but you can see it's quite a large, uh, wide-reaching group. Um, and it's growing. Um, and as Jane mentioned, we're developing outreach strategies in areas that maybe aren't as represented by this map. Um, so it's going to continue to grow. I'm really excited about that. Um, in addition to the individualized outreach that we do with each community institution researcher that, that uh, was represented by a pin on the map we just shared, uh, with support from the Mellon Foundation and the University of Waikato, we have been able to offer two small intensive training programs. Um, there's some photos from these programs here on the screen. Um, and each of these trainings uh, was specifically for Indigenous community members. The first took place here in Lenape Hopi in August of 2022, and when was in attendance, it was so great to have her and um, some other really amazing folks there. Um, and the second was held in Ontario in February of this year. Uh, we've had over 50 people from around the world participate in these programs, including indigenous community members, leaders, tribal historic preservation officers, archivists, collections managers, students, researchers, um, and so much more. And these programs were developed to equip participants with the tools to support indigenous communities, institutions, and indigenous or sorry, uh, in indigenous cultural and intellectual property, um, as well as indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, we also equipped participants with tools to be able to utilize and share about the traditional knowledge about cultural labels, the notices, the local context hub, and ethical collaboration. So I'm sure we'll have more training programs in the future, and we're excited to share more about this incredible network that just continues to grow. 
So in addition to our uh, large network, we have some specific networks that we've created um, to support different groups of people within the local context community. So we have three working groups or networks on the left that meet semi-regularly online. Um, and they're really about um, being a, a place to support each other, to learn from each other and to knowledge share. So we have a group for Indigenous community members, a group for cultural institution staff, and a technical implementation working group. Um, and we're very grateful for the folks who have helped make these groups happen. Um, we've also started to, to have some regional groups. So we have a group in New Mexico, as well as Hawaii that I'm getting started. Um, and we're hoping to see more of those kind of regional support networks uh, as well. All right, so I'm going to share pretty briefly about some of the communities that I've had the pleasure of working with, and I wish we could spend more time, but I'll just share some quick highlights. You know, there's going to be some other great examples shared throughout the day, so I wanted to talk a bit about some that you might not have heard about before. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention is the Jajawaram Clan Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, they've developed this project that combines both cultural knowledge with modern agricultural technology and research to develop methods to grow large scale um, kangaroo grass. So I'll just be sharing very briefly. We don't have any images for some of these examples just yet. Um, we've also been working with the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center, which primarily represents Como and Miwok communities. Uh, and they developed labels a number of years ago. They've been working with Mocker too, but Corey and I have been meeting with them to support their transition uh, onto the local context hub. Uh, I also wanted to mention the Dolphin Head Forest Preserve, which is developing an interactive story map project in partnership with our Story Bridge. And Rahe Wanyatunama is uh, planning to be here today. She might go in later, but she will also be sharing about this work at the upcoming Native American and Indigenous Research Study Association Conference, which is happening, I think, beginning tomorrow in Toronto. So if any of you are headed up that way, be sure to check out Rahe's presentation. Um, and then I, lastly, I wanted to mention the Pawnee Nation, who Corey and I uh, just met with and today already have labels established in Mocker 2. And so we're working with them to again transition onto the local context hub and support their development of cultural sensitivity protocols. Um, and then we have a couple of more detailed examples that we wanted to share. Uh, this is the Wo of Yante project, which was developed to rematriate Dakota and Lakota language recordings from institutions around the world and make them accessible to language learners via this interactive, searchable, and culturally sensitive website. Uh, we're currently working with community representatives to support their customization and implementation of the labels using the hub. Um, and this is just a manga, it's not live on their site just yet. Uh, but we are working with Elliot Bannister, who is a language specialist with the Sandy Martin Institute Tribe. Um, and they also participated in our training in August. Um, but this is just a great example of a story that was told by Ella Cara Gloria. Um, and you can see under the, um, the image on the right side, under the object description, that this particular story um, or the recording um, and then the written version on the right side are held by the University of California. Uh, but the Sandy Rock Sioux Tribe plans to implement the traditional knowledge labels under the rights and licensing field on this site. Um, and this particular story has the TK seasonal label. I don't want to go into detail just to be respectful of that, but I just thought it was a great example of the potential use of the labels. Um, and then another quick example. Um, I wanted to highlight this project, Yurea uh, my language that was developed to uh, share the unique languages, stories, and cultures of Cook Island communities. Uh, Corey and I learned about this project through Tapu Jukura Rea and Samson Samsonan, who worked with 10 Cook Island communities to create short videos um, to act as a resource for community members who are interested in learning more about their language and culture. Um, so Tapu and Samson worked with community members to support their customization of the labels, 
Um, and they implemented the labels uh, both when they're applicable on screen as the participants are speaking and then in the credits as well. Wish I could share more with you about some of the work we've been doing, but I'll just look at that for now and pass it on to Corey. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to highlight a couple of institutions, but this is kind of a crossover between the institution, um, really amazing efforts that have been going on um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So this is Manhattan Tile Landcare Research, which is a research institution based in New Zealand. Um, we can talk at length in other places about this, and we'll be happy to share those resources, but we really wanted to give a, a huge shout out because of the incredible work um, Manhattan Tile has added uh, BC notice to every single one of their 670,000 records. Was it in context of the API? It's really, really impressive. Um, but also, you think that API, Kakatoya, Taranak, and Rotoro have added their labels to um, stuff that have been collected from their lands. Um, and that's about 6,000 labels. So, really impressive work that we just wanted to shout out really quickly. Um, so I'll talk about the institutions, a couple quick highlights, again, you're going to hear from other folks later today, um, but just to start us off, um, the University of Queensland in Australia has added uh, some notices to their eSpace, which is their institutional repository, um, which is really amazing to see. Um, the New Fields Museum, which is the Indianapolis Museum of Art, um, they received a grant um, from the IMLS to resign their online collections. Um, just yesterday, they actually presented with these mock-ups, and we're really grateful that they were able to share these with us to, to show what the label, uh, excuse me, the notices are going to look like um, in their new online uh, database. Um, and you can also see, so they're using EMU, um, you can see that they've been adding the notices here in our rights module, which is really exciting. I'm really grateful to be seeing this work. Uh, another quick highlight, um, the Welcome Collection based in London. Um, the Welcome Collection along with the University of Kent and Denan College Library and ASU, um, they've been a part of a 12 month initiative funded by the NEH, as well as the uh, UK's Research and Innovation Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and they have been working on developing a reciprocal approach to um, some type of mindful access to indigenous materials that exist outside of indigenous communities. Um, so we've been seeing some really great thought come out of that. Um, they've also added these two notices, the Open to Collaborative Action and Complete to this page on their website. Um, so really amazing work there. Um, Fortifon um, is an open source photographic archive. Um, Fortifon.us has added the notices into their infrastructure so that any of their users can actually add notices. Um, they've added a selection of the attributes to complete and TK notices to select records in their site. And a really exciting recent example, um, the main state archives are first state archives to join the local context hub. Um, they've added an open collaborate notice um, to a couple of different websites. Um, we're really excited to be seeing this work taking off. Um, they're also using the archive space plugin, which you'll hear about in a little bit. Um, can you think that they're the first step to use the plugin to add the notices labels to their site? Then we'll stop there so you can hear from the other amazing speakers here today. Um, we are on social media, would love to give us a follow. Um, but thank you so much. And with me, we're going to pass it over to you to introduce yourself. 